Lynn's Township Environmental Services Department, and one of our ongoing programs that we do is called Walk in the Woods. And as many of you figured out, we're not walking in the woods this evening. We are here to talk about <laughs> what you may experience when you go for a walk in the woods. So tonight we have a wonderful presentation. Um, Kathy from Friends of Texas Wildlife is going to be here. But before I pass it off to her, I just wanted to take a moment um, to remind you all to silence your cell phones if you haven't already. If at any time you need to get up and use the facilities, there are restrooms right down the hall here. And our presentation um, is roughly about an hour. We'll have time for questions. And um, Kathy has brought some great resources back there on the tables behind us. I think most of you may have stopped and seen those as well. So if you have um, any questions after tonight's presentation, um, like I said, my name is Amber. Zoe is over here at the table as well. We both work for environmental services. And our department is a resource on not only um, learning about wildlife, but we also can um, address questions about what are the best native plants to attract birds and butterflies to your yard? Or um, how do I recycle mattresses? Or um, how do I save water in my house? And so um, please use this as a resource. If you haven't, stop by and pick up one of our resource guides. It kind of gives you a um, snapshot of what we offer. So as I said, Kathy is here from Friends of Texas Wildlife. If you are not familiar with this organization, they are a wonderful, well-established group of volunteers here in our community that serve um, Montgomery County residents, um, specifically um, the animals of Montgomery County, as well as the residents who may happen to encounter those animals. So Kathy is going to talk to you about what that organization does, uh, which is very fascinating. And then she's also going to share with you guys some of the um, resources that they offer, as well as what you guys can do to help support their organization and what they're up to. So let's give a round of applause and welcome Kathy. Hey, good evening. Can you hear me okay? I'll use my teacher voice. Um, my name is Kathy Couder, and I am the education coordinator for Friends of Texas Wildlife. Uh, we are a volunteer organization, and Amber, as Amber said, we serve Montgomery County. We also serve about seven counties to the north. Uh, Friends of Texas Wildlife is a nonprofit organization. We do not receive any funding from any state, federal, or local agency. Um, everybody thinks we get, some, get money from Texas Parks and Wildlife. No. Uh, they give us a big book of regulations to follow, but no money to do it with. Um, all of your donations go to support um, the rehabilitation of the native Texas wildlife that we care for. Um, we've been around for about 25 years. Um, all of our rehabbers are volunteers. And to become a rehabber, um, there's like a five-step process. Um, and our rehabilitators are permitted through the uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife and also through the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Department. Uh, we're located not very far from here. Um, on uh, kind of near the intersection of um, uh, Dobbin Husmith and um, 2978, uh, so not, not too far from here. Um, we purchased our current facility in 2011 and we have expanded it and improved it and it's, um, it's serving us very well. There we go. Uh, volunteers with Friends of Texas Wildlife do many tasks for us. Um, they help with intakes into the center. Um, we do not go out and pick up animals. So if you call and say, oh, you know, I have this little baby squirrel on the ground, what do I do with it? Well, you'll need to bring it to us. Since we're all volunteers and we're very limited on uh, the numbers that, of um, workers that we have, we don't have the manpower to go out and pick up animals. We rely on the public to bring them to us. So the uh, volunteers at the intake center will help take care of those animals once they come into the center. Um, we have patients and educational ambassadors on site that have to be cared for, fed, um, answering phones, um, inputting data, 
for every single animal that we take in, we have to have an ID number on it, where it came from, who's taking care of it, um, the GPS location of its release. So there's a lot of data to take care of. Um, fundraising, um, rehabbers also rehab the animals in their homes. Because our center is only open Monday through Saturday from 10 to 2, most of the rehab work is done in the rehabbers' homes because some of these little babies need to be fed every two or three hours. Um, I have lots of volunteers that help me with my education programs. Uh, we have uh, just regular yard and um, flower bed maintenance and also transportation. Um, we work with a couple of vets and if they have an animal that comes into them, um, we have a crew that goes and picks up the animal from the vet to bring it to our center. So we take care of all native Texas wildlife. Not dogs, cats, livestock, anything. Um, we take care of all mammals, all birds, but the only reptile we do are turtles. There's another group that does snakes. No, thank you. Um, one of the um, animals that we take care of are white-tailed deer fawns. We get hundreds of calls every spring, and fawns are usually born from about Mother's Day until about the 4th of July. And they'll call and say, oh, there's a baby deer in my yard, and the mother's not here. What do I do? It's going to starve to death. And you say, put the baby back. Um, does do not stay with the fawns. Fawns do not have a scent until they're about two or three weeks old. They're also not strong enough to be able to follow mom. So mom parks it in a spot where she thinks is safe, hence the spots for the camouflage, and then she goes off to eat, taking her smelly deer self with her. Um, at dusk, she'll come back to feed the baby and now that spot smells like deer. So more than likely, next morning, that fawn's not going to be there because she's moved it to a new spot that doesn't smell like deer. So even if you have a fawn in your yard, don't worry. Mom will be back. And by the next day, more than likely, it'll be gone. The only time we need to rescue a fawn is if we are certain mom has um, passed away for some reason or another or if the fawn is injured. Um, if the fawn is um, laying down, kind of all tucked up, it's fine. Um, if it's laying on its side, if its legs are out straight, that's a concern. If it has flies on it, that's a concern. Those are the only times that we need to bring fawns in. Um, as I said, we get hundreds of calls every year about fawns. It just takes a little bit of education and uh, most people are, are um, happy to just kind of watch the fawn for the day and enjoy it, and then it's on its way. Um, we get about 50 fawns a year. And unfortunately, last year, um, Texas Parks and Wildlife really restricted uh, the rehabilitation of fawns. So we can now only take from Montgomery County. As I said, we used to be able to um, take animals from seven counties. We still do other mammals, but for fawns, we can only take from Montgomery County. Um, and that's due to some of the new state regulations. And what's the logic behind that? Good question. There is none. <laughs> um, they were concerned about chronic wasting disease. And... Um, Chronic wasting disease is a um, fatal uh, viral disease that uh, deer can get, and they can pass it on to others. So far in Texas, it's only been found in three spots, uh, West Texas and a couple of places up in the hill country, and they've all been in deer breeding facilities. But their fear is that um, a fawn will have it and not show signs of it, and then be released into the wild and spread it. Um, and so now we can only take from Montgomery County. We have to tag them with a little ear tag. Um, but you know, they don't know the county lines. 
And so a hunter that gets a deer, you know, four years from now, that deer may have moved over a county line or two. So it's a good question. And they haven't been able to answer it for us. Um, and again, put the baby back. Fawns uh, don't travel with mom until they're a couple of weeks old. Um, she'll leave it in a safe spot and um, she'll come back for it in the evening. Raccoons. Um, this is the beginning of baby raccoon season. Um, raccoons usually have about four babies in a litter and they usually have them in some kind of den which might be a hollowed out section of a tree or your attic. Um, we get calls every year about people who have raccoons in their attic and the only time that a raccoon's going to be up there is if it's a female having babies. Males won't go in an attic. Um, if you have a raccoon in your attic, there's a three-pronged approach. Light, sound, and noise. Um, light, sound, smell, sorry. Um, leave the attic light on. Um, put a radio up there on talk radio because they don't like the sound of the human voice. And smell. Put a stinky old dog blanket up there because that's a predator to them. Or you can go to a sporting goods store and get some tennis balls. And over in the hunting section, they have coyote and fox urine. You squeeze it on those tennis balls, chunk them up in the attic, and that will tell mom this is not a safe place to be. It might take her a couple of days to find a new den for those babies, but she'll move them along. Then you can find that hole that she came in through and patch that up. It would be more effective if you used all three. Um, and it, it's going to take a couple of days. It's, it's not an overnight process because she's got to go find a new den. So light, sound, and smell. Um, raccoons, we always try to get them to reunite with mom. So for instance, maybe you had a tree cut down and there was a uh, family of raccoons in the hollow part of the tree. Um, you can get those babies and put them in a box and put them at the base of, of another tree that's close by. Mom will come and get them and take them to a new site. We always try to reunite those raccoons with mom because raccoons are the longest, um, have the longest term of rehabilitation of any of the animals that we have. We have to keep them in care for eight months. Uh, because they would normally be hanging around with mom for about a year. So eight months is a long time for a rehabber to have to commit to taking care of that animal. Uh, when they're born, they're about the size of a, a little kitten. Um, we use very special formulas. It's not anything that you can buy at Tractor Supply or Petco or anything. Um, we get all of our formulas for each species from a company that makes nothing but wildlife food. Um, they make anything from uh, raccoon food to uh, moose milk and bear milk. Uh, you name it, they, they have the formula for it. Um, so the babies are kept warm. They're given their uh, special formula. Um, they're kind of like newborn humans um, in that you have to get up in the middle of the night to feed them. Uh, they have to be stimulated to go potty. Um, after they graduate uh, from their little nest box, usually in an incubator, then they go to larger cages and larger cages until they're finally outside. We do not put our raccoons outside until they have had their distemper shots. There has not been a raccoon in Montgomery County that's been tested positive for rabies in 25 years. It's this temper that gets our raccoons here. They can get feline and canine distemper. So it's very important for you to keep your pets, both your cats and your dogs, up to date on their vaccinations. Um, the past couple of years, we've had a really bad outbreak of distemper in our raccoons. 
Um, so we vaccinate all of ours before they re are released. Uh, before they're released, we uh, teach them how to find food in the wild. We'll put fish in their water bowls. Uh, we'll give them little um, crawdads. And it's hilarious to watch them try and eat a crawdad for the first time. They don't know what to do with those little pinchers. Um, and um, we might throw some you know, little lizards in there, worms. All the natural foods they need to learn how to hunt. So again, light, sound, smell to encourage mom to leave your attic. If you have a mom raccoon that just doesn't get the message, um, you might need to call a pest removal company. The only one that we will recommend is 911 Wildlife because they use the extruder boxes. A regular pest control company that kind of takes care of your bugs and such, um, they will live trap the mom and they will put that trap in a drown tank. And then the babies are left behind and then you, you end up dealing with babies. And then they eventually end up coming to us. So you want a pest control company that will guarantee you that they will use an extruder box. And what that box does is um, they'll go up in your attic or your shed or wherever mama is with her babies. They will put the babies in the box and then it has a one-way door. Mom will come in to take care of her babies and then they take the whole box out and release them in a safe place. Um, if you just trap uh, mama with like a, a live trap that you get from tractor supply or whatever and take her away, or even if you have a male that's, that's on your property getting in your trash cans, um, that really doesn't solve your problem. If you remove one, another one will take its place. Um, if you remove that one and take it someplace else, it has lost its territory, it's lost its source of food, it may have left a mate behind, so it doesn't solve the problem of a raccoon on your property. You need to eliminate that problem. Um, if you are leaving food out at night for your cats or dogs, if you feed it, they will come. Pick up all pet food at night. Um, if you're having problems with your trash cans, um, either put a bungee cord on them, put them in the garage, secure them somehow. Um, I live on a couple of acres and we have lots of raccoons that come visit our house. And in the 18 years that we've been there, we've never had a problem with them getting in our trash cans because we have good trash cans and we keep them secure. Um, so it's just a matter of eliminating their food source. We have three kinds of squirrels in uh, this area, and right now is the beginning of baby squirrel season. We have the gray squirrels, which are the ones that you probably see most often. They're the ones with the little white tummies. The fox squirrels are the ones with the orange tummies, and all the rehabbers want the fox squirrels because they are the chill dudes of the forest. You can love on them and they're easy to feed. You know, they don't fuss, they don't fight. A gray squirrel would rather bite you than let you feed it. Um, so everybody loves the fox squirrels. We also have flying squirrels here. Um, they are very rarely seen because they're only about the size of a hamster and they're nocturnal. And they live in the very tops of the trees and they use that um, membrane that goes from the wrist down to the ankle to glide. They're not really flapping, they're not really flying, they're gliding. And they can glide about 150 feet or more. Um, and unlike the gray squirrels and the fox squirrels, flying squirrels live in colonies, much like a bat would. They can have anywhere between eight and 30 members in that colony, and they share their food. They put it in little storerooms or little caches. Whereas the gray squirrels and the fox squirrels are pretty solitary unless they're, it's during mating season, but they're usually pretty much on their own and they're the ones that bury the nuts in the dirt. Um, so all the beautiful trees that we have here in the woodlands, thank a squirrel.
Um, they only retrieve about 80% of the things that they bury, the nuts and the seeds and the acorns. Um, so that other percentage are, grows our trees. Quick question. What's the relative, popu oh. what's the relative population between the three types? In the, um, area. The, uh, the gray squirrels are the most populous. Um, the uh, fox squirrels are larger than the, the gray squirrels. Um, probably, it's probably about maybe 60% gray squirrels and about 30% um, of the fox squirrels and 10% of the flying squirrels. Um, and the flying squirrels have big black eyes um, because they are nocturnal. And if you go outside at night and you hear something that sounds like a little bird chirping, it's not a bird, it's flying squirrels. They make a little peeping, chirping sound. So as I said, it's the beginning of baby squirrel season. And if you find a baby squirrel the first thing we always ask for you to do is try to reunite with mom because mom can take care of that baby better than we can. Um, you'll put the baby in a box at the base of the tree where you think it came from and give mom a couple of hours to come back and retrieve it. They're very good moms. If they can get to baby, they will take it back to the nest. Uh, they pick it up um, by the scruff of the neck just like a, a cat does. Um, if you um, put the baby squirrel out after a couple of hours, mom still hasn't come and gotten it, then uh, you'll need to retrieve it and um, take care of it until you bring it to us at Friends of Texas Wildlife. And, oh, let me go back. All right, to do that, you want something to put the baby in. So get a shoe box and then get a piece of fleece or even an old t-shirt. Put that in the bottom of your shoe box and then use a rice sock to keep baby warm. Or you can put the box on a heating pad that's set on low. A rice sock is simply one of those socks that lost its mate in the washer or dryer. Um, you put about a cup of uncooked white rice Tie a knot, and then I like to flip it over so the baby doesn't get stuck in the cup. And then this goes in the microwave for about 20 or 30 seconds, and it acts like a little miniature heating pad, and it will keep that baby warm. The most important thing to do is to keep it warm. So you're going to put that under the blanket. Don't put the baby right on top of this because it will burn it. Um, put it underneath the blanket keep baby warm, and call Friends of Texas Wildlife, and we will tell you whether to give it some uh, hydration or not. If you're told to, then you can use some Pedialyte, and these are just Pedialyte pops. It's the easiest way to do it. You pop this in the freezer uh, and just keep it there until you need it. Then when you have a little animal, whether it be a squirrel or a raccoon or whatever it might be, you just cut off a little bit because a little squirrel's not going to need this whole thing. So you just cut a, a little bit off that frozen pop, put the rest back in the freezer, then this part, put it in a little, um, like an empty baby food jar or a shot glass or something small, warm it up, and then either use a little syringe or an eyedropper to uh, give the baby some Pedialyte until you can get it to a rehabber. Do not give any animal, whether it's a squirrel, raccoon, deer, bird, anything, do not give them anything to eat or drink other than Pedialyte. Um, some of the things that um, are sold um, either at um, Walmart, Tractor Supply, Petco, or whatever, they have preservatives in them that are um, toxic to wildlife, especially the canned ones. There's, those are high in preservatives, and the wildlife can't tolerate it. Um, also, if you give a baby 
that is cold and dehydrated, any kind of milk or formula, their stomach can't digest it and it, it will be their undoing. Um, we get babies brought to us that have been given all kinds of um, different formulas and uh, bloat and it, it makes them very sick. said we get all kinds of little um, baby squirrels this season. If you need to cut down a tree, if you can possibly wait until after baby season is over, um, because most trees in this area have some kind of wildlife living in it, whether it's a bird or a raccoon or a squirrel or something, a lot of our trees here are homes to some of our wildlife friends. Um, this little guy fell out of a nest, broke his leg. We were able to um, take it to the vet and have him x-ray it. We put a little splint on it and he was eventually released. If you have any animal that has been in the mouth of a cat, it must come to a rehabber. Cat bites, cat saliva is toxic to wildlife and they need to be started on antibiotics within 24 hours. So uh, that was that baby box I was talking to you about, the shoe box, an old t-shirt or piece of fleece, and the um, rice sock. Opossums, and that is the proper way to say it, is opossum. Possums are a different species of animal that live in Australia. We have the Virginia opossums here. Uh, they are a very unique animal. They are the only marsupial in North America. They have an opposable thumb. So we have that, monkeys have it, and also opossums have that opposable thumb. The tail is prehensile. It helps them hold on to tree branches as they're walking through. Um, they will climb trees to escape a predator. They'll also use that tail as a fifth hand, and they'll grab a bunch of leaves to take back to their nest for bedding. Mom opossum can have up to 13 babies in that pouch. Um, she's only pregnant for less than a week. Doesn't that sound good? <laughs> um, so she can have 13 babies in the pouch, when they're in the pouch, they latch on to a nipple and they don't have to suck. It just dribbles in. Um, they're in the pouch for about two months. After two months, they climb onto mom's back. So moms, 13 babies on your back, 24 seven, two months. She's a good mama. Um, while she, while the babies are on her back, um, they're learning how to survive. It's kind of like a little traveling school bus. They're, they're in class. <laughs> After two months, mom either shakes them off or she climbs under a tree branch and scrapes them off. And that's it. You're done, kid. You're on your own. Um, opossums are very beneficial. Everybody's like, oh, they're ugly. No. They're very beneficial. They eat snakes and they are immune to their venom. They love cockroaches. They eat thousands of ticks every year. And so those are the ticks that are not going on you or your dog causing long Lyme disease. And um, they, don't, they don't really have any defenses. The only two ways that they can protect themselves is they open their mouth and they hiss and they show off those 50 teeth, which is more teeth than any other mammal in North America. And if that doesn't scare you away, then they kind of drool, and then they play possum. They just faint. Um, because most predators want to chase prey. And if it's playing dead, it's not prey anymore. So then the predator will hopefully leave it alone. Um, they are, um, they have a very low body temperature, and so they don't harbor rabies. Yeah. 
Right. If you have to capture an animal that needs assistance, first make sure that you have contacted Friends of Texas Wildlife so we can tell you whether that animal needs to be rescued or not. Um, protect yourself, wear gloves. It's always best if you have a buddy with you, have your phone ready, and you can just throw a towel over the animal. It doesn't matter whether it's a squirrel, a raccoon, or an eagle. You can throw a towel over it to kind of contain the animal, pick up the whole bundle, and put it in a pet carrier or a cardboard box. We ask that you do not put them in those um, wire kennels, especially birds. Uh, don't put an owl or a hawk in those wire kennels. They can get their wings stuck through those spaces. So a cardboard box is the best thing for those guys. And then keep it quiet until you've contacted a rehabber, brought it to Friends of Texas Wildlife. And um, again, don't give it anything to eat or drink until you have talked to someone to find out whether it even needs anything to eat or drink overnight. So birds of prey or raptors, those two terms are kind of interchangeable. Um, we get many hawks and owls. Most of those come to us because they've been hit by a car. When they are hunting, they are kind of single-minded chasing that squirrel, rabbit, mouse, whatever it is that they want for their supper. They're not paying attention to the car that's coming. And if it's at night, most drivers aren't going to see that owl. So uh, we get a lot of our birds that have been uh, hit by a vehicle. Sometimes they just have a concussion and they can hang with us for a few days and recover. Uh, they may need a wing wrap um, or some other first aid. Uh, this hawk had a, a broken leg when he was hit by a car, put a cast on it, and he recovered and was later released. Uh, these are little baby screech owls. Uh, their tree was cut down, and so unlike squirrels and raccoons, a mama owl can't pick up her babies and take them back to the nest. So if they fall out of the nest, then um, they have to be rehabbed. Uh, we have four kinds of owls in this area. We have the eastern screech owl, which is only about six inches tall. Um, we have barn owls, which we don't get very often. They're usually way back on farms and ranches in a barn. Uh, lots of times deer hunters find them in their blinds because the blind has been vacant all year. And so a barn owl has taken up residence. And um, they have those pretty white heart shaped face. We have a barred owl, and it's named a barred owl because those look like jail bars on its chest. And the great horned owl. And those tufts up at the top, they're not really horns. They serve a purpose. You know, this funny part of our ear that we hang our earrings on serves a purpose. Sound comes in, hits this funny thing, and then goes into our eardrums. Same thing for those feather tufts on a great horned owl. It comes in, hits those feather tufts, and goes down into their ears. Um, their ears are just flat little discs on the side of their head, and they're also, unlike ours, they're kind of cattywampus. You know, our ears are kind of straight across. An owl's ears are kind of whoop. One's higher than the other one, and the other one's further back. And that's kind of so they can get surround sound. They need good hearing because they've got to hear that mouse rustling through the leaves to get its supper. Um, for the barred owl, their face is very flat. And so the sound comes in and hits those feathers. All the feathers are kind of directed back towards the ears. And so the sound comes in and, and gets their ears there. Um, we have several um, owls in our care right now. We have two barred owls that are education ambassadors. They were injured and could not be released into the wild, and so we use them for um, teaching purposes. So I take them out when I go uh, do presentations 
or if groups come to us at our education center. Um, owls have several adaptations to help them fly silently. If you think about a robin or a blue jay flying in your yard, going to your bird feeder, you can hear them flying. You can hear those wings flapping. You won't hear an owl. They have lots of down on their chest and that kind of helps muffle the sound. They have fringes on the edges of their feathers that helps to break that wind noise. They also have feathers on their legs. And you can see a little bit on that great horned owl, he's got some feathers there on his legs. If you picture a robin, he doesn't have feathers on his legs. But those feathers on the owl's legs help them fly silently. There it goes. Um, owls cannot turn their heads all the way around. They turn it 270 degrees. So if you hold your head still and kind of cut your eyes that way and then cut your eyes the other way. So we have a pretty good peripheral vision because our eyes can rotate in our skull. Owl's eyes are so big and they're shaped to the point that they cannot turn them in their skull. That's why they have to turn their whole head around to see. And they can do that because they have twice as many vertebrae in their neck than we do. Um, if an owl could read, if you were standing on one goal post of a football field holding a newspaper and the owl was perched on the other goal post, the owl could read that paper. They have excellent vision. Bald eagles. Um, we are one of only four facilities in the entire state of Texas that's permitted by the federal government to rehabilitate bald eagles. If you follow us on Facebook, um, you'll know that we have three bald eagles in care right now. Um, Normally we get bald eagles in uh, December, January after hunting season because they have lead poisoning. Um, all three of these eagles have had injuries. Uh, we think one of them was hit by a car, uh, another one was shot, and another one was attacked by another um, bird of prey. Um, so they are with um, our raptor specialists. Um, they have to have special permits in order to rehabilitate the bald eagles. And um, we have a 100 foot long flight cage that is used to um, condition the, the eagles when they're ready to be released. And they have to be able to fly that 100 feet uh, flight cage three times without hitting a perch and be able to turn and bank and catch live prey and then they're released. There are many um, pairs of bald eagles in Montgomery County. I'm sure you've uh, heard about the ones that you have here in the woodlands. Uh, there's a pair over in Tomball. There's two or three pairs up at the lake. So they're, they are around. Uh, their main diet is fish. And if we get them after hunting season, it's due to the lead poisoning. If a hunter goes out and he, if he has used uh, some ammunition that has lead in it and he shoots that animal and he leaves part of the carcass out in the field, if the eagle eats part of that, that lead goes into his system, eagles are very susceptible to lead poisoning and it really damages their nervous system and their digestive system. Also, if an eagle has taken a fisherman's hook, line, and sinker, those sinkers are made out of lead. And if an eagle comes to us that has lead poisoning, we use chelation therapy um, to help leach that lead out of their system. And it's a long process. It takes months. They're also very expensive to feed. So this is our eagle flight enclosure. Um, and it took us several years to, to raise the funds to build that. And the, of course, the federal government told us all the specifications, how to give us any money to do it. Um, 
But uh, as I said, we're, we're one of very few organizations that have that. Here we go. Um, we take in all birds, whether they are migratory birds or birds that stay here, like our mockingbirds. Um, we have some of our rehabbers kind of specialize in birds. Some of our rehabbers specialize in, in mammals. Um, if you find a little bird that looks like that one on the left, that's a fledgling, and it needs to be left alone. If a bird has all of its feathers and a stubby little tail feather, and it's on the ground, more than likely it's a fledgling. Birds don't know how to fly when they're in the nest. They have to fall out of the nest, and then they go on the ground, they kind of hop and flutter, hop and flutter, until they get the hang of flying. In the meantime, the parents will come down and still feed that baby. Um, it's kind of like a human toddler. When they're learning how to walk, they take a few steps and fall down, take a few steps and fall down. Same thing with birds. So, nestlings, if you find a nestling, if it's a naked bird, that's a nestling, and try to put it back in the nest. If you cannot find the nest, or if you can't reach it, get a, an old Easter basket, or even a cool flip tub that you're gonna poke holes in and hang it up in the tree, and hopefully mom and dad will hear that baby and come down and continue to feed it. Um, again, those uh, on the right are fledglings. You can see that they have all their feathers and they have that stubby little tail feather. Those should have been left where they were. Um, we get lots of calls in the spring during baby season. Um, oh, there's a baby bird on the ground and my cats are going to get it. We can't take in every bird just because there's cats around. Uh, we wouldn't have space for any other animal. Leave the cat inside, you know, take the dog out in the front yard instead of the backyard, wherever the bird is. Um, it only takes a few days for that baby to get the hang of flying. If, if it's not possible for you to separate critters, then uh, you can pick up the baby bird and put it over in a safe place. As long as it's within like 30 feet of where you found it, the parents will still come down and feed it. Don't worry about... Uh, your hand touching the baby bird, mom doesn't care. She doesn't smell you. That's not how they find their food. Birds don't smell. That's an old wives tale if you touch a bird in the body. Um, if a bird hits a window, put it in a box and put it outside, um, maybe under the shade of a tree or on the table and on the back porch or something. Sometimes they just kind of get knocked silly. In a couple of hours, they recover and they, whoop, they fly out of the box. Um, if it doesn't fly out of the box or if it has an obvious injury, then you need to get it to a rehabber. Turtles. Um, as I said earlier, we uh, turtles are the only reptile we take in. Uh, the most common ones we get are the red ear sliders and the three-toed box turtles. The red-ear sliders are those ones that are always on the road. And those are the ones that are trying to cross the road to go to a different pond or find that per perfect nesting spot. It's those guys that are always hit by cars. Um, if you see a turtle on the street, only if it's safe, stop and move the turtle in the same direction it was going. It was going in that direction for some reason, so let it keep going. Don't say, oh, I have the perfect pond in my neighborhood and I'm gonna go take it and put it in that pond. No, turtles are very territorial. Their space is only about the size of a football field. Um, if you take it out of their area, they're gonna forever spend the rest of their life trying to get back home. And sometimes they will starve themselves to death trying to get back home. So leave it in its space. Uh, Three-toed box turtles, we get a lot of those because a dog thought it was a toy. They found this brown ball in their backyard and they started playing with it. 
and they bit it and they poked some holes in the shell. They got tired of it and they put the ball down. And the ball moves. So then they go and pick it up again. And so we get turtles that have a couple of dog bites on them. Again, those are very territorial. Um, the three-toed box turtles and the ornate turtles um, were declining in population here in Texas because so many were taken out of the wild to be pets. People don't realize that they live for 30 years. So after the kid's already gone to college and graduated and gotten their own family, you're still stuck with the turtle. Um, it's not a good pet. It doesn't play, it doesn't roll over, it doesn't talk to you. It just, it's not a good kid's pet. So it's best just to leave it in nature. Um, there for a while, Texas Parks and Wildlife even had a uh, turtle sighting um, report thing going on because their numbers were so low. So the best thing to do is leave them alone. Again, if you see a turtle on the road, it's probably a red ear slider. It's looking for a new pond. It's looking for that perfect uh, bank to lay the eggs in. If it's safe, pick it up and move it in the direction it was going. Um, some of our unusual patients, um, those are little bobcats, um, armadillos. I have one that I'm rehabbing at home right now. Um, armadillos are cool. Um, they're always born in fours. Always four, and it's always four girls or four boys. They, they can't have both. Um, and when they're born, their shells are pink and they're so soft. And they're, they're about the size of my fist. Um, but they're very difficult to rehab because they don't suckle. Um, so you have to weigh them, then you have to put them on their dish of food, see if they eat, then you have to weigh them again, and then you have to put them in their dirt box to potty, and then you have to weigh them again. And that's for one. And that's every three hours. So we stay busy. Um, skunks, we have one of our rehabbers who loves to rehab skunks. And um, she's had her pre-exposure um, rabies vaccinations. Skunks and bats are the animals that carry rabies in, in this county. So um, if you come across either one of those, if anyone is scratched or bitten by either one of those, then that's a call to the, the county health department. Um, but everyone always asks, well, don't they spray her? Well, no, they don't spray her because she's mama. And also she knows how to handle the skunks. If you come across a skunk, if you're out camping or out on a walk, they're gonna give you plenty of time. One of the first things they're gonna do is they're going to stomp. They're gonna stomp on the ground. That's your first warning. Then they're going to do a handstand. You need to be moving. <laughs> because then that handstand is gonna turn around and get sprayed. So they give you some warning. The best thing to do if you come across a skunk is quietly back away. Then that's gonna startle it and then it's gonna spray. Just quietly back away. If your dog gets sprayed by a skunk or two, um, tomato juice mm -mm, doesn't work. Find the formula on Google. It's hydrogen peroxide, baking soda, Dawn soap. Hydrogen peroxide, baking soda, Dawn soap. Each one of those attacks a, a, a particular chemical in that skunk spray to eliminate it. Tomato juice doesn't cut it. Um, also, a, we got a pelican. Uh, last year, which, you know, pelicans really don't belong up here, especially the brown pelicans. That's, that's Galveston. Um, and um, they, they can fly and hop pretty well. So starting off in the bathtub didn't work because he figured out how to get up on top of the, um, the, the counter and was attacking the, the mirror image. That didn't work. 
Are they just which, which of the animals that are rooting in a garden or more? Is it the armadillos or the skunks when you find little rootings? Uh, armadillos. Armadillos, not yeah. skunks. They don't. Um, not so much. They don't dig as big holes as the armadillos do. So if you have a hole, and especially if there's lots of holes yeah. in like a little tunnel, that's an armadillo. And unfortunately, there's not a thing you can do to, to keep them out of your yard. The only thing you can do is have a, a solid bottom fence because they can't climb. So our goal is to release all of the animals that we uh, take in and we have a really great percentage of, of animals that, that make it. Um, each rehabber has his or her own special release spot. Some of us live on property, some of us have friends or family that live out on, on ranches or so, uh, or other properties. Um, so our goal is to always release them back out into the wild. With hawks and um, owls, they have to go back where they were found because they are very territorial and they also mate for life. So we have to release those right back where they were. There it goes. Um, so if you find an animal, um, contact Friends of Texas Wildlife. There's uh, brochures on that blue table that have our um, email and uh, phone number on there. Even though we're only open Monday to Saturday from 10 to 2, our help email line is answered until 9 o'clock at night. And if Nikki's on duty, midnight. She, she can't stand for an email to stay there. Um, we have an um, active Facebook page and a website. Uh, there's all kinds of great information on both of those, what to do if you find a whatever, um, how to find a rehabber. If you happen to be visiting family or friends, say in San Antonio or Austin or Oklahoma, uh, you can go to the website Animal Help Now. You put in your location and it will find a rehabber near you. Don't try to um, rehabilitate wildlife get it to a rehabber. In Texas, it's against the law for you to have wildlife in your possession without a rehabilitator's permit. It's okay for you to be in the process of transporting it to a rehabber, but you have like a you know 48 hour window. Um, don't feed wildlife. As I said earlier, if you feed it, they will come. They don't need your help. There's plenty of food out there. You don't need to supplement raccoons or squirrels or whatever, they could find it. Don't move them to another area. You've taken them out of their home. It would be the same someplace without your, your home and your family. Um, pick, make sure you're picking up your food at night. Um, I've talked about this a little bit already. Um, the uh, rabies vector species Bats and skunks are the ones that um, you have to be careful with. If there's a bat in the house, you need to call your local animal control. Uh, we do not rehabilitate bats. Um, if someone has been bitten or scratched by either a, a bat or a skunk, you must contact the county health department. Um, as I said earlier, there hasn't been a raccoon diagnosed with babies in over 20 years, 25 years. If an animal is stumbling, if it's not using its back end, uh, especially in raccoons, that's a sign of distemper. In distemper, they, they kind of act like they're drunk, they get overly friendly, they use the, the use of their uh, back legs. Um, animals that are overly aggressive have uh, some other neurological issue going on. There we go. Um, common misconception. Yes. Distemper is a neurological um, 
disease infection, and it's it's 100% fatal, uh, and it's highly contagious. So that's why it's important to keep your pets vaccinated. If um, when we are having a high distemper outbreak, um, rehabbers will change their shoes when they come into the house. Um, we, you know, we'll even change clothes because if you walk across your backyard and there's raccoon feces or urine there and they have had distemper, and if you walk across it and then you take these shoes into the house and you're feeding your baby raccoons, you contaminate them. So it's, it's highly contagious it's, and it's a neurological. Once, once it goes to the brain, it's, it's not. If you walked in your backyard and then you walk in your house, would that distemper then also go to your cats or dogs? It could if they're not vaccinated. If they're vaccinated, they're fine. Uh, bats on the ground um, doesn't mean that they're um, rabid, doesn't mean that they have rabies. The bats that we have in this area are the little brown bats, and they cannot take off from the ground. So if we've had a windy storm, sometimes they get knocked out of their roost and they're on the ground. They can't fly up from the ground. So you take a dustpan, put some leather gloves on like your garden gloves, take a dustpan, scoop up the bat, and put it at the base of the tree. He'll hold on to that uh, tree, and then at dusk, He'll climb up a little bit higher and take off. They have to swoop down into flight. Um, rabid opossums almost always falls. Their, their body temperature is so low they can't harbor the disease. Um, we have a very active um, education program. Our education center is located on the same property as the intake center. Um, there's a brochure back there that has a lot of information about the education center. Um, we have a lot of touchy-feely things for the kids to explore. Um, that's our outdoor classroom that we built so we could still hold classes during COVID. Um, we have second Saturday every month when our education building is open to the public. Uh, we have things for the kids to do, crafts. We bring educational animals out. Uh, we have Boy Scout and Girl Scout uh, troops that come out and work on badges. We have lots of Eagle Scouts that come do projects. There's big service projects. Um, we've had a lot of um, boys come out and work for us. Um, I go out and go to churches, schools, libraries, I've gone to oil field companies. Um, I, I'll go anywhere somebody will let me talk about wildlife. Uh, we have summer day camp, birthday parties. Uh, we have homeschool groups that come and have field trips. What can you do to help? You can um, be, become a rehabber. You can uh, volunteer at the center. You can help by donating either um, monetary gifts or donation of supplies, and I, there's a list back there of the things that we use all the time, like baby wipes and paper towels and um, old uh, bath towels, newspapers, We're short on newspapers right now. Um, if you shop at Kroger or even Amazon, you can tag Friends of Texas Wildlife and then we get that little percentage coming in. Okay, I'm going to bring out a friend. This is Pogo, and he is an opossum. Um, he is just a little over a year old. Um, he was um, a baby during last year's snowstorm, and I'll bring him around. Um, and he got frostbite on his front feet, and so he's missing some digits on his front feet, and he's missing his, his toenails, and so he would not be able to climb a tree to get away from predators. 
So he's an educational animal for us. So if you can see this prehensile tail is grabbing. What? I know I worked you up. They're nocturnal, so I woke them up. So, um, so that doesn't go there. Um, I'll come around. You can pet him. Um, he's, people are surprised at how soft they are. So feel how soft he is and then feel the tail. Um, if you'll cooperate, you can see that posable thumb on his back feet. Um, um, he stays with me and he has a, um, a special diet. He's on a diet. His, he was weighing 13 pounds, which is probably twice the size of your little neighborhood opossums because he's a little spoiled. Um, yeah, your, your neighborhood possums probably only weigh about six pounds. So I'll come around and you can pet him.